After this morning, um, I'm reminded of the visit of a great British designer, theorist, William Morris, to Iceland in the 1870s, and his official verdict in his diaries was weird. <laughs> but, but seriously, I'm, I'm so delighted to be here, and I think there is a wonderful energy and, and life force about this, this meeting. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is magic moments at, at MoMA, where I now work in, in New York. Uh, these are a few responses of our visitors. We leave out these pencils and bits of paper where visitors do record their experiences. I went to MoMA and, and magic happens at MoMA. People fall in and, lo in and out of love, um, not all the time, but, and not for everyone, but magic happens. And we can't always explain it, but as a curator, that's what I'm always looking for, both in the design we collect uh, and the way we exhibit it. <clears throat> These are two of my favorite images from the collection. This self-portrait by Herbert Bayer, the German designer, humanly impossible. And then Man Ray's photograph, the laboratory of the future, really design can help us visualize the incredible, uh, the, the impossible, and, and the future. But it also connects in such a real and immediate way to people's everyday experiences and our multi-sensory engagement with the world of things and the spaces we engage with on a daily basis. So how do we corral all these amazing objects which were available to me as a curator in the architecture and design department uh, there. How do we corral them uh, into meaningful uh, clusters for people that can help open up the portal, that gateway to the unexpected, uh, to the invisible? And hopefully fueling creativity or inspiration as part of a process that continues outside the museum. So I'm responsible for collections which include everything from a textile design by Annie Albers from the 20s to this extraordinary uh, chair, La Chaise, by Charles and Ray Eames in the 50s, um, a helicopter, a Polish poster uh, from the 60s, or humble objects and masterpieces like a shrimp cleaner or a, a kitchen mop. <coughs> and most recently, we've been looking at areas like the design of film titles. This is a still from the design for James Bond's, uh, the James Bond Goldfinger film. And we're now looking at collecting also video games, uh, in one of them designed by Eve Online here, here in Iceland. So these are the kind of raw materials in themselves, each one a, a concretization of the immaterial and material uh, in, in, in our collections. And we can engineer, on the one hand, these kind of shock and awe encounters with the unexpected, like the giant uh, whale skeleton by Gabriel Orozco, uh, outlined with graphite uh, pencil, each, each bone. That was, as you can imagine, quite a feat of engineering to have this uh, colossal skeleton hung in our atrium space, mobile matrix. But then there is also room for the quieter magic moments, those contemplative moments that we've heard about. Uh, the moments of recognition, but also altered perception, seeing objects anew, the familiar becoming strange and the strange becoming familiar. That Oppenheim fur cup or object, you just have to look at it for the hairs to stand up on the back of your neck. And I think 
we all can viscerally relate to that sensation, uneasy, uncanny sensation of a hair in the mouth that you accidentally ingest <laughs> with the drink. These are experiences that leave an imprint, a, a, a residue. And so much about the trajectory of modern design seems to be about the development, as we heard this morning, of this abstract form language, in a sense banishing uh, magic or keeping it at bay. But there is this constant dialectic, which you see even between the Oppenheim fur cup and the, the Sutnar tea set of the same period in the 1930s, that interplay between the rational and the intuitive. For me, that was something that was particularly pronounced in relation to, to play and my exploration of, of childhood and design for children. That magic of play, which is so wonderfully captured in the 1920s by Alma Sitov Buscher, who designed this, this nursery furniture. They were just like giant play blocks, uh, which children could uh, explore, invent in different forms, whether as a seat, a table, a, 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 a train, a carriage, or a puppet theater, as you can see on the uh, image up there. But at the same time, there was room within the Bauhaus uh, culture and environment for this very surreal, intuitive, open-ended play amongst the students themselves. And you can see Alma, Alma Boucher there in this, engaged in this mirror play with many of her fellow students, just seeing where they could stretch the boundaries of perception. Again, that porous uh, play between the, the fantasy and the real, between alternate <laughs> realities and ways of being. And making space, I think, in our design education for, for play, and indeed in all our lives, is something that's been, been proven again and again, and something that's becoming, if anything, increasingly Im important in all our lives. I mean, when Crick and Watson were discovering DNA, that was really the result of setting aside their Fridays for, for play with these, with these models of the essence of reality. This is the image uh, from the way into this, this show I organized, Century of the Child. And it covered, a, it brought together about 550 objects in very different medias and, and, and scales to explore this whole uh, region of design, design for children. And we chose that image for the title wall, taken in 1971 by Jens Jensen uh, in the outskirts of Jutteberg in, in, in Sweden. And it shows young Michael, who's dangling precariously from the wall of this rather bleak housing project. And for me, it's an image about children's resilience and inventiveness, their constant capacity to reinvent themselves uh, and test themselves through, through play. In this case, almost despite the, the alienating architecture. But it's a playful gesture that makes us as adults again, look at the space and place rather differently. And for the catalogue, I chose this image also from the 70s of a back court in, in Glasgow in Scotland where these two young boys have just got their Christmas presents. And for me, it's about how a nylon space suit and a little plastic helmet and a rubber bouncy ball, the space hopper, how those simple means can really catapult these kids into another universe, another place, an alternative reality. And that, th 
theme of creative play ran right through the exhibition, starting with this giant version of a chair I'm sure you're familiar with here too, by Peter Opsvik, the Trip Trap Chair, a model of flexible design that literally grows with you from childhood to adulthood. And this was a very important way of actually helping visitors make that, to open themselves up to a new way of looking. Um, and children, adults of all ages, sizes, um, every description were clambering and photographing themselves. We have such a flicker stream of people picturing themselves on this chair. And it does really make you smile and feel, inhabit the child's world momentarily in a very physical, embodied way. And that was carried through the exhibition um, and, and recapped at the end with the equally popular Shadow Monsters by Phil Worthington, this interactive uh, shadow play which took the ancient form of shadow play but enhanced digitally with burps and farts and a wonderful kind of soundtrack which made the stiffest visitors suddenly open up as well as suddenly sprouting uh, you know, arms and teeth uh, from your heads and fingertips. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful piece. And that idea of playful magic was given a, another twist in a recent acquisition currently on display in the museum, which is this windblown mine deminer uh, by Masoud Hassani. As a child in war-torn Afghanistan, Hassani made toys out of whatever materials he could, materials <coughs> to hand, and among his favorite were these rolling objects powered by the wind, which he would race and test um, with, with his friends at the time. And often their toys would be blown into these minefields from which they couldn't be retrieved. Uh, and so, but many of Hassani's childhood friends were injured or killed uh, by landmines. And when he was in design school in the Netherlands, he really remembered this experience or took this experience to a new level by making these toys all over again only much bigger and heavier and stronger. And with these sensitized um, uh, plastic caps on these bamboo shoots, which <laughs> could be intentionally released into minefields and then uh, explode uh, the mines. And e it's very easy to transport and, and, uh, and assemble. And it's designed to roll over, rather like a dandelion flower, over these... Uh, threatening minefields. <coughs> and then these biodegradable parts can be, once they've exploded, can be gathered again and reassembled. And for me, that's this wonderful, magical uh, process of assembly, reassembly, transformation of very limited means. But I'm fascinated by those, those magical moments, the leap of faith required in so much design after long, often long periods of development where suddenly things click uh, and, and a, a wonderful new design or iteration is made possible. And these are just some, some posters from our collection from uh, the early 1900s to the 30s where these designers have given a visual expression to the new technological wizards, uh, the new forms of energy that were transforming uh, people's lives in a very fundamental way. And that sense of uh, the radiating color and light and atmosphere that, that comes from switching on that simple light bulb or again, the sparks that fly in these images of the spark plugs from Lucien Bernhardt's Bosch of 1914 uh, to Herbert Beyer's Electronics, 
a new science for a new world. So it's heralding a transformation that is not just technological, but, <laughs> but spiritual and social as well. And also helping us to traverse time and space in a new way. In another Herbert Bayer image, and it's an image that he played with in a, a number of ways, called Things to Come. I don't know, but I suspect this was maybe for the, for the film of the H.G. Wells uh, novel. So in this, I think you get a very clear sense of that oscillation between looking inward and outward, and a sense of trying to give expression to these networks that tie us in, tie all the objects uh, that we work with in to larger patterns and constellations of, of meaning. And then uh, this 1981 advert for uh, Honeywell's electronic mail, familiarizing people with the, the unfamiliar new idea. What the heck is electronic mail? <laughs> As it erupts. Uh, in these swirling uh, light, uh, light forms ar around this, this terrified business, businessman. But a far more powerful and, and visually compelling iteration of the same idea is another recent uh, acquisition. This interactive media piece which is constantly in flux and changing, because what it's doing is sampling and digesting and revisualizing these incredible amounts of, of data, these celestial mechanics visualizing these myriad objects, the satellites, aircraft, balloons, which are hovering around the Earth um, at any given time. So it's parsing information that's already been collected uh, to create these visualizations of uh, travel paths over uh, North America. Again, the sense of though tying us into these larger networks and patterns, grounding us with a sense of the invisible. All the time, even in taking things in and out of the fridge, we're leaving these traces, these imprints uh, of our actions, our interactions. And that sense of the unseen and intangible uh, networks of which objects are part, and which was so poetically um, evoked for us this morning. Um, you see here in this, this photograph, and also in this piece, um, these paper chairs by um, Tokuyin uh, Yoshioka. This honey pop armchair, which is actually made out of the same paper that's used for Chinese lanterns, that used here to create a chair that once peeled and opened in this accordion style, just takes the imprint of the first person who sits, who sits on it. So leaving that impression, leaving traces, Designers have been fascinated by that sense of the traces, the imprint. Uh, Man Ray in the 1920s, like actually many other avant-garde artists and designers, was fascinated by photograms, by placing objects, just household kitchen objects a lot of the time, on light-sensitive paper, which is then exposed to light and creates a negative uh, image of the object. And around uh, that time, Man Ray was embracing this irrationality, these reversals, um, the way that you could get a white shadow or space that's turned inside out. But he was also interested in that lack of control that an artist had in making photograms. And there's that little bit of of chance that was involved in creating an image. But it, it, it certainly, for me, communicates this energy, this 
internal energy that seems to radiate uh, not just from, from ourselves, but from objects. And there's a sense of that in that image of the cheese, the ghostly image, after image of the cheese slicer in use. Or again, taken up by um, designers trying to map in a scientific way our interface with the environment. And this is a light drawing that Herbert Matter did of a man dressing, where the figure actually disappears altogether, and what you're left with is this map of the movements that, that uh, were generated. And that begins to be used um, in studies of time and motion, uh, which were so popular in the 1940s. This is from an article on efficient and inefficient cleaning, so that you could visualize for people the two ways of scrubbing a, a dish. But designers have, in other words, I, I, in other spheres, made material transformations of uh, the, the objects they're looking at. Uh, I found this advert, recycling works like magic, and that's very much the spirit of Paul Kirps's auto reverse, which is, uh, again, a sound piece which shows these decomposing and recomposing machines made from electric appliances. Uh, but in the process, these new uh, machines or monsters are created, which reveal the, the surreal and frequently redundant functions of much of that uh, technology. Designers, designers have grappled with the transformation of food and, and expressing that for over a century in these images. Van der Velde advertising in the most cutting edge visual language at the time, an egg-based protein which was industrially produced. Uh, and what these three images document is that increasing distance uh, and increasingly abstract relationship that, that most people have with, with food, which is so processed and globalized um, as an industry. But at the same time, Schutema in, in the 20s is again looking not just at the industrial production of uh, milk powder, uh, but the transformation, both political and social, that that is going to bring with it. And that's all woven together in this, um, this image for Nutricia. And then Damien Hurst's piece, The Last Supper, a series of 20 um, uh, uh, prints, and this one is steak and kidney, uh, reduced to tablet, tablet form but through naming it The Last Supper, again, reintroducing that idea of transubstantiation or transfiguration uh, through, through design. This idea of distance from food was taken up in a, in a very poetic way by this piece called Pig 05049. It was a project over three years where my Detzma tracked all the products and parts of the pig and illustrated or included in this book form all the products related to that single, that single pig um, from obviously ham or the products we would recognize to cosmetics and, and film and toothpaste. So in a sense, you've got a visual catalog of this afterlife or uh, alternate life of, of an animal, which explores the complexity of uh, the food processing industries and the many points of contact that we have with animal products that we might not be aware, with, uh, aware of anymore. But that sense of flux and entropy 
and mutable materials. Again, you could see in these three images, uh, Tiffany's glass, uh, this wonderful, fragile, blown glass form with which he experimented, and there were many disasters and collapsing uh, pieces along the way. Uh, but this wonderful vase capturing that moment of flux, that arrested movement, which actually again points to those unstable boundaries, um, unstable states of being. And that's continued uh, in many other designs, but a more recent one is the series that um, Gaetano Pesce did for the Pratt Institute of Design in New York, a series of chairs where he was injecting this resin of increasing densities into a series of nine chairs. The first one just entropically uh, collapsed under its own weight. This one, you can still see that element of morphing in the unstable base. And only by the ninth version do you get a chair that could sustain the weight of a, a full adult. And it, taking that a bit further, these two more recent uh, designs, the honeycomb vase, where what the designer did was to provide a, a structure which a zillion bees could actually then inhabit and populate and create this honeycomb vase. So just letting nature take its course in this form of prototyping that starts and ends really with flowers. What you have at the end is a vase for, for flowers. Or the solar sintered um, bowl taking the most elemental forms of sun and sand to be found in a desert environment and exploiting the idea of um, the change of state uh, triggered by intense heat of, of, of silica. But again, this vase, it's caused our conservators complete nightmare because it's, it's decomposing as I speak every day uh, we are finding more grains of sand uh, around, around the bowl. But uh, just a reminder of the unstable state of the world we inhabit. When I was looking at this whole topic of magic and thinking about it, I started searching around for adverts mentioning, mentioning uh, <coughs> magic, sorcery, and the naming of products. And it was just a reminder to me how saturated with magic the whole language of commodity culture that we live in is. Uh, and it's a ubiquitous trope for a whole range of visual and verbal descriptions of products that will affect this magical transformation um, of our beauty, our sex appeal, health, happiness, cleanliness, culinary skills. Could your hair use some witchcraft, darling? Something bewitching just happened to hairspray. Of course, it, it hasn't, and the reality is that clogged up, horrendous feeling of, of hairspray, which is anything but bewitching, in a good sense. <laughs> uh, effortlessly, indeed automatically, our eyelashes are transformed with Maybelline's magic uh, mascara or a dab of midnight poison and will be transformed into this bewitching, seductive, dangerous looking enchantress. Or in cleaning products, um, I, was, I found this magic yeast one particularly scary. It's, it's all right. Well, it's, it's a scarily bad <laughs> pun. Uh, <laughs> In fact, a lot of this imagery is, is not the kind of thing I'm looking for to put in the MoMA collection. Uh, but the idea that uh, we can introduce a fairy to help us with the, the washing up. I, I grew up uh, with, with fairy liquid. Or eating black magic, 
or SOS, some magic scouring uh, pads. This is the whole kind of language that, um, that Bart talked about in his essay in Mythologies on the new Citroen DS, which was launched in 1957. And the name DS, um, DS itself, pointing to this otherworldly, out of space quality that many fetishized commodities assume um, when they're spotlit in this way uh, or in a car showroom. And he talks about how these magical objects look as though they've fallen in perfect form from the sky. And they appear as a messenger of a world above that of nature. And that you can sense this perfection and an absence of origin or, or closure in these objects. And a transformation of, of matter which he describes as more magical than, <coughs> than life. That kind of quality, I think we sometimes translate into the context of the museum in the way we decontextualize or spotlight some of the design objects in our collection. But perhaps no site is more redolent of the language of magic uh, in the commodities that come into it and the whole almost alchemical processes of translating raw materials of food into, in, into a cooked form is, is the kitchen. And the kitchen, as I explored in the exhibition uh, called Counterspace, Design in the Modern Kitchen, has been the site of and a very intensive modernist exploration of new materials and uh, technologies, as you see in the Frankfurt Kitchen by Greta Schüttelhotsky of 1926, this fitted, almost tailorist uh, incarnation of the, uh, of the kitchen. But the magical side can't be suppressed, and this Colani, Luigi Colani design uh, for the Cologne Furniture Fair in 1971 literally is like the kitchen that has descended from outer space. Uh, it's designed to be operated by a single person on this swivel chair doing, doing everything. Again, if you just look at all the language of magic in food and, and, and cleaning products related to the, the kitchen, uh, we all want to be that perfect cook magicking up these perfect meals. But again, I don't know about you, but for me, the reality is never like that. I wish I could be this, this wonderful cook. But that's the kind of promise, the allure that so many designed objects seem to... Uh, hold out, and it does speak to this very deep-seated need that we have to pour ourselves into material things to the extent that they almost seem to have their own independent force and power over us, as though they can really make us behave and perform in, in certain ways beyond our control. The frigid air uh, appliance here. You'll feel like a queen in your kitchen, surrounded by frigid air appliance magic. And mealtime magic with margarine, that's not one I fancy. <laughs> but these objects speak to that allure I was talking about and that sense in which we're projecting fantasies on, onto such, such objects. The naming of a salad a shaker as a magic twirl around, that for me almost conjures up 50s um, women in these full skirts 
dancing ar around in, in this magical way. But it's a salad shaker. <laughs> that, that whole dimension of material, immaterial, is uh, critiqued in this photograph, series of photographs by Mac Adams. When I first saw them, I was looking at tiny thumbnails, and I thought, oh, that just looks like an advertising photograph. And then, mm -hmm. I, on closer looking, I saw um, the bikini-clad form. In the next image, the figure is completely recumbent um, on the kitchen floor in the reflected image. But the idea that a magic wand could release women from drudgery. You've got the ghostly apparition of the old-style kitchen with cast iron, smoky, dirty uh, interior that she's leaping away from into her, into her new post-war fitted uh, kitchen. And this, this film that I was going to try and show, but I wasn't technically adept enough to embed the video. But it's worth looking at. It's a, on, available on YouTube called Design for Dreaming. And this uh, professional dancer dances her way from this car showroom into this state-of-the-art General Electric kitchen. This is 1956. Just like a man, you give him a break and you end up in the kitchen baking a cake. This was a kitchen like none I'd seen. Put a card in the slot and onto the screen comes a picture of just how your dish will look. It has all the ingredients you need to cook. No need for the bride to feel tragic. The rest is push button magic. <laughs> so whether you bake or broil or stew, the Frigidaire kitchen does it all for you. <laughs> that idea though is taken up by Laurie Simmons, who creates these um, doll's house interiors. And this, this one in the kitchen, they're all propped up with matchsticks and carefully lit. She, she would shoot the model at different times of day and, and playing with scale in this uneven way. Uh, but she said, scale wasn't an issue to me if the loaf of bread was half the size of a woman herself. That wasn't a problem. That seemed like it gave it all a kind of magic. The chairs, the food, the stove, the sink, the woman. I like the way they all occupy the same space in the picture. I like the way in that kitchen, it's always five after six, always the dinner hour. <laughs> but our connection with, with things edible is so visceral and emotional. And through the power of art and design to engage, I think there is this possibility in this arena to start changing people's perception of what food is, where it comes from, and, and what it means. The kitchen is so laden with our experience of where we laugh and cry and meet friends with and smash things and create wonderful, um, wonderful food as well and, and share that food. So they become these sites of mystery and, and fantasy and, and the supernatural as well. Who knows what this man is really seeing when he looks inside that, that fridge? Um, and you hope it's not Sigourney Weaver in Ghostbusters um, <laughs> coming out of the, f the, the fridge. Uh, and, and William Eccleston, uh, these amazing photographs of the rather grimy, creepy inside of the oven, which really does look like the portal into um, outer space or that place that we never really like to go, the freezer, <coughs> with all its overtones of um, the dead or the decaying, or arrested decay, uh, which are there. Those things at the back of the freezer which we know we should have excavated <laughs> long, long before. Uh, 
but the, the quality of these color images is, is, is so compelling. It really communicates that sense. And that sense of incipient violence and drama uh, that happens in, in the home. By far the greatest number of household accidents and, and ultimately even uh, a, a atrocities and domestic violence actually takes place in, in the kitchen. Again, we don't know what this woman is planning with, with the knife, uh, but that sense of changed, altered perspectives is is there also in Casabir's Fork in the Fridge, and with the potential, even with a humble potato, to erupt into a, a kitchen frenzy, where the potatoes are going to fight back in Anna Bloom's <laughs> kitchen frenzy, with a life of their own. Which brings me back to where I started, and the, and the role of the curator, really. Whether we're ultimately magicians or, or, or jailers. When an object becomes a museum piece, it's removed from circulation in the wide, wider world of things and, and enters a kind of gated community. And I sometimes have fantasies of a Toy Story moment in our stores with all these objects where perhaps they really don't like being next to uh, the other object they've been, been placed, or group of objects they've been placed with. And how do we, as curators, then reintroduce them, give them a new kind of social life, make new connections between objects, creating dialogues, nonverbal dialogues between uh, the material of design or with new audiences in, in the museum? These are two uh, wonderful exhibition designs from the 1940s. On the one hand, Rudowski's exhibition about fashion, Our Clothes Modern, with these fashion models literally imprisoned in a kind of fashion system within this uh, context of the gallery. Or on the other side, uh, an exhibition about design for use, which shows the overstuffed Victorian chair as an endangered species, like the um, gorilla gargantua, which is put behind bars. But there are the opportunities to actually give a new <coughs> lease of life to, to some objects. These are two favourites with many of my colleagues that were excavated, having not been seen, I think, since they first came into the museum in, in the late 40s. The one on, on top, they were, they were both designs for um, the low-cost furniture competition held by MoMA, using uh, very basic materials. In fact, I think we thought that the one on the left is a bath mat recycled with a simple inner tube. That one is known as the Muppet chair. And then the swampy chair, which was looking very sad, um, which we had to inflate and then it would sag, sag pitifully before our eyes, rather like the, the rosemary when it's not watered um, or, or you know, we, we can care and curate for, for objects in, in a similar way. And hopefully, as I say, bringing them into new networks and, and new forms of social life. Thanks. <laughs>